Okay, good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is Mike Stroster. Uh, I'm with Sandy Andre, and we are going to present to you this morning on how the Department of Labor Regulations change what you think you know about the Family First Corona Response Act. Um, it's been an eventful couple of weeks, obviously. It has also been an eventful few days, and we know that you're following along with all of this because of the questions that you submitted in, in advance. And for those of you wondering how the new executive order as of Friday morning regarding the stay at home, stay safe is going to affect all of this. We are going to touch on that, but we expect to have a more thorough uh, discussion on, on that topic probably later in, in this week. So what we're gonna focus on this morning is what's new as of the Department of Labor regulations being issued only on April 1st. That seems like it was a long time ago, but frankly, it was only five days. So we're, the, as you know, the PIMS First Corona Response Act went into effect on April 1. Uh, the Department of Labor issued regulations that same day to implement the, <clears throat> excuse me, the act. You probably noticed on our slide here and elsewhere where you've read or heard about these rules that they're called a temporary rule. Um, that's really just a procedural matter that allowed these rules to go into effect quickly. Um, don't get distracted by that. These are the, the Department of Labor's rules on, on this act at, similar to any other regulations that you have. It means only that uh, they were able to go into effect quickly and they will expire this year on December 31st, 2020, uh, unless there is some other action by the Department of Labor or by the, by the Congress. So these regulations were implemented to expand, <coughs> excuse me, were issued to implement the expanded Family Medical Leave Act Expansion Act and the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Um, the regulations confirm much of what the Department of Labor uh, produced in its frequently asked questions and its uh, guidance to employers and employees. Much of the same information on issues like telework, layoffs, small business exemptions, um, and, and other issues that we've uh, highlighted for you already in a webinar. But the regs make a number of clarifications and highlights on some issues that we might have to start looking at a little bit differently going forward. So what we're gonna to do today is we're going to go over what's new, we're gonna go over what's not new, and we're gonna explain the Department of Labor's position on a number of these, of these matters. You undoubtedly already have employees either on leave, um, asking for paid leave, or who thoroughly misunderstand what these paid leave requirements are, so we're gonna go through all, all of that. This webinar, though, it, it is designed to go over what's new and different. It is not going to be an overview of the Family First Corona Response Act. We actually already did that for you via webinar on Tuesday, March 31st, and that webinar is available on our website at millerjohnson.com. Of course, we are going to answer all of uh, your questions, so please send them through using uh, the Q&A feature uh, on the webinar. We already have some for, for you, and we're going to try to get to as many as, of those as we possibly can. So with that introduction, I'm going to hand things over to Sandy, who's going to take us through what's new and interesting on these DOL regulations. Sandy? Very good. Thank you, Mike. Well, good morning, everybody. And as Mike mentioned, um, with the temporary rule that came out on April 1st, we can generally um, put, put what we know about uh, FFCRA into one of four categories. Something was not new, something was new, um, we received a clarification on something, or we received an explanation on something that helped us understand what the DOL was telling us in their frequently asked questions. So that's 
that's the format we'll go ahead and follow this morning. The first piece um, regarding payout upon separation. So of course, there are two paid leave provisions under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, emergency paid sick leave and expanded FMLA, right? So paid leave goes along with both of those things. What is not new, I want to make sure I, I say this clearly, the FFCRA does not create an obligation for you as the employer to pay out any unused paid sick leave or expanded family medical leave time, right? So there's not a requirement to do that. However, we, for um, those of us who are Michigan employers, I want to point you back to the Michigan Payment of Wages and Fringe Benefit Act, right? So that act requires employers to pay out fringe benefits in accordance with their written contracts or written policies. So your uh, policy in your handbook um, or your standalone policies and fringe benefits include time off for sickness or injury. So right now, for example, if you have um, a statement that talks about unused uh, sick time or um, you know something um, more general, if your intention is not to pay out emergency paid sick leave or unused expanded FMLA time, you probably want to go ahead and put something like that in your policy. Now, certainly um, state laws vary a lot on this point. And so for those who are listening who have employees in states other than Michigan, you will want to refer to your state's law regarding um, how unused benefit time um, may be paid out or is required to be paid out to employees upon separation. But that's an important um, point just to bring this provision together with existing laws. Next slide, please. Another interesting feature, um, we're by now, right, we're, we're a whole five days in, we're all very well schooled on, on, on what employee eligibility thresholds are, right, for emergency paid sick leave and expanded FMLA. And so on the emergency paid sick leave uh, side, we know that that is immediate eligibility, um, but the amount of time an employee receives depends on um, kind of their status. On the expanded FMLA side, though, we know that an employee has to be employed for at least 30 calendar days. So with the temporary rule, there's um, uh, m several, several pages of commentary before the actual regulations. And the Department of Labor provided a little bit of guidance here on um, how we should be thinking about recalled or rehired employees, right? So um, for those maybe who have already um, downsized in some way, laid off, um, laid off the workforce even prior to April 1. It's going to be important um, for us to review this piece so you know how to treat those employees once you are able to call them back to work um, as we look forward into the future, okay? So the additional guidance on how to treat recalled and rehired employees, the Department of Labor says, this includes employees who were laid off or otherwise terminated on or after March 1st, who had worked for the employer for at least 30 of the prior 60 calendar days and were subsequently rehired or otherwise re-employed by the same employer. <clears throat> so again, the big takeaway here is really um, nothing for you to necessarily do right now, but something for you to file away, kind of put in your tickler file. If you've recently downsized um, when you call these folks back or you rehire these folks back in the future, you may have some that become immediately eligible for expanded FMLA, depending on how long they had worked for you before the downsizing. So again, nothing for right now, but something to file away um, to have top of mind when you're able to bring those folks back. Next slide, please. As Mike mentioned at the beginning, um, the FFCRA certainly contemplates telework and the definition necessarily of telework um, did not change, okay? Um, but there was a piece here in terms of how to pay employees that are teleworking. So again, what's not new, the Department of Labor is telling us that generally they are going to use the Fair Labor Standards Act and apply that 
to employees who are teleworking. So the guidance that they've given under the FLSA regarding telework, when somebody's workday begins and when it ends, generally they are going to be applying that to folks teleworking um, under situations um, that, that may be covered by FFCRA. However, one piece that they are adjusting, um, which this is an employer-friendly adjustment, um, is adjusting the continuous workday guidance. So uh, here in the FFCRA rule, the Department of Labor is saying an employer allowing telework during the COVID-19 pandemic shall not be required to count as hours worked all time between the first and last principal activity performed as hours worked, right? So generally under the FLSA, that's that's the standard. You know, we, we pay, the clock starts running, so to speak, um, when somebody starts their first principal activity and goes until the last principal activity. But here, the Department of Labor is certainly um, understanding that uh, based to other based on other reasons, right? Perhaps you yourself, the person who's teleworking, is experiencing uh, COVID-19 symptoms and is seeking diagnosis, but can uh, work remotely, inter you know, intermittently during um, during the time that they're seeking diagnosis, um, or they're caring for a child whose place of care or school is closed, and so they're using um, needing. Um, to, to restructure their workday a little bit differently. And so this is providing um, the employer with, uh, with more flexibility. It's, it's really just saying, hey, employer, use the time that a person is actually performing duties rather, this, rather than this continuous workday guidance um, when we're talking about uh, telework specifically under FFCRA. Next slide, please. Okay, we're going to spend a little bit of time here because I want to reiterate a couple of things and a couple of questions that were already submitted um, speak to this. And so, that, as Mike mentioned, this tells us you guys are definitely um, on top of what, what is happening here um, in, in the different changing of events. So, let's go back. Um, Right, let's go back in time travel to April 1st <laughs> when it, uh, the FFCRA, of course, has six uh, covered reasons that an employee may take emergency paid sick leave. Um, and one of those six reasons is also the only reason that an employee can use expanded FMLA, okay? So we'll take a look at each of those reasons in order and talk about um, additional guidance the Department of Labor has provided with uh, the issuance of their temporary rule, okay? So we know that that first reason is if an employee is subject to a quarantine or isolation order um, by a, a government official or a public health official, healthcare provider, those pieces, okay? So we want to reiterate here, what is not new? So employees are not eligible for emergency paid sick leave if their business closes temporarily due to a downturn in business related to COVID-19, okay? So if you are a business that is open um, and you have not been implicated, you're not required to close um, by uh, the governor's uh, stay at home order, um, but you do because you have not, you no longer have any business and so you are closed. Your employees are not eligible for emergency paid sick leave. The reason for their leave is not related to a quarantine or isolation order affecting that employee, okay? An additional reason an employee is not eligible for emergency paid sick leave if the quarantine or isolation order forces a, forces the business's customers to stay home. So it's a similar reason, right? So our business is still open um, with uh, the governor's stay at home order, but now we don't have any customers. And so we're gonna go ahead and close or limit operations. Again, that's an economic reason that your employee would not be working, not a quarantine or isolation order specifically directed at the employee. Okay. And similarly, if a quarantine or isolation order forces a business to close. So here in Michigan, we know our stay at home order specifically speaks to critical infrastructure um, types of employers and uh, uh, suppliers and service providers that, that support the critical infrastructure. Um, but other businesses generally are required to close. And so to be clear, um, even though that order forced your business to close, 
um, your employees are still not eligible for um, uh, emergency paid sick leave for that reason, okay? But importantly, and probably what's been prompting some of your questions, the temporary rule certainly contemplates that some stay-at-home orders can be quarantine or isolation orders under FFCRA under that first reason, okay? So it includes um, information such as follows. Quarantine or isolation orders include a broad range of governmental orders, including orders that advise some or all citizens to shelter in place, stay at home, quarantine, or otherwise restrict their own mobility. So last Friday, Sarah Willie talked about this a little bit on our webinar, and we'll go into it more a little bit here. Next slide, please. So let's specifically apply that to Michigan's stay at home order, which is 2020-21, right? So if we look at our current order, employers can designate certain workers to come into work if they cannot do their work remotely, all other workers cannot leave home for work, but they can work remotely from home if possible, okay? So let's apply that to those reasons um, under that first reasons under FFCRA, right? So we have a quarantine isolation order that may force a business to close. And if we remember from our previous slide, an employee is not eligible for emergency paid sick leave for that reason. Okay, a quarantine isolation order forcing a business's customers to stay home. Remember that an employee is not eligible for EPSLA under, under those reasons, okay? So generally, EO 2020-21, if it's uh, impacting the business and you're making a business reason to uh, close or limit operations, uh, reason number one under FFCRA would not apply to your employees. But let's go ahead and go to the next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me, because as Mike mentioned, um, on Friday, an additional executive order was issued 2020-36 here in Michigan. And this is a little bit of a different kind of stay-at-home order. And we want to go through and, and discuss how this stay-at-home order applies to reason number one under FFCRA. So generally, EO 202036 permits certain employees to stay in their home under certain circumstances. And generally, those certain circumstances are if an employee is experiencing uh, COVID-19 related sick symptoms, um, or somebody that they've been in close contact with is experiencing symptoms, right? And so, um, so right, we, we don't want an employee who is sick to come to work, and we don't want an employee who is, who is potentially um, been in close contact with somebody who is experiencing symptoms to come to work. So this, um, that piece makes perfect sense. So let's apply this to FFCRA, right? So FFCRA explains that an employee may take paid sick leave only if being subject to one or more of those orders prevents him or her from working or teleworking as described therein, okay? So let's apply. Under 2020-21, you are an organization who is open in some capacity. You may have limited operations, but you are still open because you are part of the critical infrastructure or you're supporting the critical infrastructure. And you have employees who are supporting critical infrastructure or necessary for minimum business operations who are still working on site, okay? So you're complying with 2021, um, excuse me, 2020-21. You've implemented social distancing and um, other mitigation strategies to keep the folks at your work site um, safe. But now under 2020-36, you have an employee who is experiencing symptoms. And under 2020-36, that employee is now unable to work, to come to work. If your employee, if you have telework um, open to that individual, so they can no longer come to work because they're experiencing symptoms as outlined under 2020-36, but you have remote work available for them, you continue to pay them just as normal, 
the, the SFCRA door has not opened, right? They haven't, they haven't experienced an event that would make them eligible for that just yet. But if you do not have remote work available and now they are unable to come to work, now, um, presuming that the employee uh, you know, meets the standards as outlined in that executive order, now that employee is subject to an order that is preventing him or her from working or teleworking um, as described in that order. And they may be eligible for SFCRA under reason number one, okay? And so then remember when your employee is um, um, going to go ahead and take leave under FFCRA, you as the employer are obligated to engage with them um, on some documentation requirements if you as the employer want to get the payroll tax credits on the back end. So um, 202036 might open the door for somebody to take uh, leave under reason number one, and then you would just go into your uh, normal FFCRA uh, request for leave documentation um, type, of, type of piece. So to be clear on 202036, in our opinion, um, it does not mean that everyone at home is entitled to paid sick leave, okay? Those that are sick or showing signs of sickness are certainly eligible, but the details of the order are really important. Um, so in the takeaway here, um, just for purposes of this webinar, should be that the new order creates a basis for someone to pay, uh, to claim rather, paid sick leave under reason number one under FFCRA if they um, are having symptoms and need to stay home and cannot telework, okay? Okay, next slide. Covered reason number two, an employee has been advised to self-quarantine. So um, essentially, um, the big takeaway here from the temporary rule is that there's been a clarification on the ability to work includes telework, okay? So an employee who is self-quarantining, um, the Department of Labor says, is able to telework and therefore may not take paid sick leave for that reason, for their self-quarantine reason, if three things are true. If the employer has work for the employee to perform, Number two, if the employer permits the employee to perform the work from the location where the employee is self-quarantining, okay, so we've got telework available for you, you're able to do it wherever you are. Um, and then three, there are no extenuating circumstances that prevent the employee um, from performing that work. So for example, um, what we know, right, there could be a fair number of people who um, have been advised to self-quarantine by a healthcare professional, um, but they may be asymptomatic and feeling able to work, and that's fine. However, right, once an employee is experiencing symptoms and they're no longer able to work, um, they certainly, um, the employer is not required, um, or excuse me, is not permitted to allow, to require them to telework. Once they are unable, then the employee um, is eligible for uh, emergency paid sick leave under FFCRA, okay? Next slide, please. We'll go ahead and take a pause here, and we'll, um, I'll look over to Mike and see if we have gotten <clears throat> any questions. Well, we have, and uh, I'm going to start with answering a few of the questions that were submitted ahead of time, but we do have some good ones in the chat feature, and or sorry, the uh, Q&A feature at the bottom, and if you want to continue to uh, submit your questions there, like I said, we'll, we'll get to as many of those as, uh, as we possibly can. So, the first question is um, a, a good one that I suspect a, a bunch of you are uh, are dealing with, and it's this. An employee was off with COVID-19 symptoms as of March 25th, 2020, and is still off. Do we have to give paid sick time as of April 1st? And the short answer to that question is yes. So uh, assuming that the individual otherwise qualifies uh, and if they're off with symptoms, of course they would, and they uh, continue to have a need to be off, they would qualify even though the need for leave started before the uh, rule became effective. All right. The next question is, <clears throat> is an interesting one. It says, are companies choosing to be exempt if they can, for instance, healthcare, 
or uh, using the small business exemption from the paid sick time. So what we're seeing right now is I think companies are being cautious about claiming exemptions, particularly for the small business side of things. Uh, the exemption for healthcare providers is, is clear in, in the act. It, it's made clear still, I think, in the, uh, in the regulations. Uh, but the, what we're seeing is a slow move towards taking a position that um, your employees are exempt from receiving those paid sick leave benefits, particularly as it relates to the small business exception. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the regulations made clearer what's necessary to establish an exemption for small businesses and in my opinion, the threshold there is very high. Uh, the exemption is this, for employers that have fewer than 50 employees and they have somebody, someone requesting leave because uh, a child's school or daycare is closed and other uh, child care is not available due to COVID-19 related reasons. And then the following, an officer of the business has made one of the following determinations that providing leave in these circumstances would cause the small business to cease operating at a minimal capacity, essentially meaning that it would go out of business, or that there's a substantial risk to the financial health of the entire operation if the person is allowed to take paid leave or there are not uh, sufficient other workers who are qualified and would allow the small business to continue to operate. Essentially, the, those three issues, when you look at them sort of uh, more broadly, are if the individual is in a position where he or she is um, vital to the continued existence of the operation, then you can claim an exemption from the paid sick leave time. And, and that is, in my estimation, a very, very high standard. So certainly it's available. The regulations make it clear what you need in order to take advantage of it. But uh, to be perfectly honest, that, that's, a, that's a high standard. And I think you do well to consult with your counsel before making, making that determination. The next question is, are there programs available to employers with over 500 employees that would help them avoid mass layoffs? And the short answer to that is not right now. Um, of course, this is a continued, uh, continuing, evolving situation, and we continue to hear reports that the CARES Act and the Families First Corona uh, Response Act are the first steps in the uh, federal government's efforts to uh, protect the economy. So it is entirely possible that those uh, programs are coming, but right now as we sit here on uh, April 6th, they're, they're not here. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So here's an interesting question. Uh, if an employee takes the uh, FMLA uh, expanded leave to care for a child home from school, can they save the two weeks of uh, paid sick leave in case they need it, presumably at, at a future time? Um, it's an interesting question. So the, the answer is, I suppose they could, though I'm not sure I, uh, I understand why that would uh, help anybody in that employee's situation. So there, there's nothing in the act, there's nothing in the regulations that prevents that from happening. And of course, in order to um, get the initial paid leave, the employee has to provide us information in order to designate it that way. So presumably if the employee did not provide us that time, um, oh, sorry, that information, then we wouldn't be able to designate the first leave uh, as 
emergency paid sick leave time, and we could for the second leave. But to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure why uh, anybody would find that beneficial. Uh, they're only going to get that one time, and um, whether it happens early or, or later, uh, I'm not sure how that changes things. But to answer the question that was asked, <coughs> excuse me, the, the there is nothing in here that says that that cannot happen. So long as we have the documentation necessary to uh, confirm the need for the leave, and then we can apply for the tax credits available to uh, pay for the leave, I, I think you'd be fine doing that. Um, the next question is this. If our healthcare workers refuse to work, would they be qualified for pandemic unemployment assistance? So the pandemic unemployment assistance is that federal unemployment benefit that you've heard so much about, the extra $600 that people are uh, are eligible for. And the question as I read it is, if employees refused to work, would they be qualified for that additional federal benefit? And I, I think the answer to that is, is no. So what, <clears throat> there, there are a handful of reasons that people will qualify for that pandemic unemployment uh, assistance, including being sick with COVID-19 related sy symptoms, um, caring for a family member who's diagnosed, being a primary caregiver, uh, and so forth, all the things we, we've talked about several times. But simply refusing to go to work, whether you're a healthcare worker or if you work anywhere else, would not necessarily qualify somebody, would not qualify somebody, I should say, for that unemployment assistance. Now, I like to be sort of realistic about these things. And the, the fact of the matter is the rules on qualifying for unemployment have been relaxed to the point where it might be difficult to challenge the, these issues in the future. Who even knows what that's going to look like as we move forward into the uh, protesting stage, but the uh, if somebody simply refused to work for, for no qualified reason, I think the answer is they're not qualified. We could protest on that basis, and if the employee uh, made some misrepresentation in their application for unemployment benefits, that would bring in a whole other host of of issues that would be problematic for uh, for the employee. So. A long way of saying no, uh, they, they wouldn't qualify. So let's see. Um, I'm going to take a look in the. Uh, oh wow, we have a bunch of questions in here, and you know what I'll do? I will um, take a look at these while Sandy goes through the next few pieces on the regulations, and I'll get myself ready to answer those questions uh, by the time we come back. So. Uh, Jeff, if you can move the slide forward, and Sandy, if you're ready to keep going, let's keep moving. Excellent. Yep, you bet. Perfect. Okay, so jumping back to uh, what's new, what's clarified, what's been better explained, we'll go ahead and go right to reason number three. Remember, an employee um, who has symptoms and is seeking diagnosis is eligible for paid leave. Um, and so the, the big takeaway here um, is Department of Labor's clarification that paid sick leave can be taken for this reason, but it must be limited to the time the employee is unable to work because he or she is taking affirmative steps to obtain a medical diagnosis. The employee cannot take paid sick leave to, uh, to self-quarantine in terms of reason number three here without seeking a medical diagnosis. So if I'm an employee who says, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm having symptoms, but I never seek out a diagnosis. They are not covered here under reason number three, okay? The Department of Labor also talked about, similar to reason number two, um, there are opportunities for an employee, if they are able, to be remotely working during this time as well. So if you as the employer have work available for that employee, um, 
and you allow the employee to perform that work where the employee is waiting on that diagnosis and the employee, um, no extenuating circumstances. As an example, they don't start to experience serious symptoms that would prevent the employee from coming uh, or from performing the work remotely. So if the employee essentially is still able to work despite um, having, um, you know, not being in the workplace, right, because they are experiencing symptoms and seeking a diagnosis, the door for number reason number three does not open to them. And presumably once they receive that diagnosis, the, the door to FFCRA benefits for reason number three closes. Now, depending on what those results are, um, or symptoms they continue to experience, another, um, another door, another covered reason might remain open to them, but reason number three closes. Okay, next slide, please. So covered reason number four, care for others. Again, just a clarification point here, um, as a reminder, similar to the reasons we just talked about, it applies only um, if, but for an individual's need to care for someone, the employee um, would be able to perform their work for their employer remotely or on site. So, um, you know, the only reason I'm no longer able to work is because now I have to care for this other individual. Okay, so that's got to be the threshold reason. And remember, um, so the employee caring for the individual cannot pay, uh, take leave if the employer does not have work for him or her. So, right, we go back to if we have already limited operations and somebody is already um, on an unpaid leave um, based on economic reasons, um, that employee doesn't have a reason for leave related to that employees need to care for somebody because there's no work available for them. So if we go back to all the other webinars we've done and we've provided the framework, the first question always is, why does the employee need leave? And if the employee needs leave because you don't have work available for them, there is not an entry for FFCRA benefits, okay? And so the last point um, related to care for others is the employee must have a genuine need to care for an individual, okay? So, and again, going back to other conversations um, we've had in other webinars, but there is some onus on you as the employer to engage with that employee in some of those required pieces of documentation if you want the payroll tax credit down the road. So um, certainly you can cast a wide net here and say, um, you know, as the employer, it's certainly your choice to say, um, you know, I'm only going to do the minimum amount needed to, to provide leave to these folks under these benefits um, that are available. But you, um, from an IRS standpoint, you need the documentation to substantiate that need for leave to be eligible for those credits. So just keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Um, reason number five, school place of closure. So um, the Department of Labor teased um, this explanation a little bit in its Q&A um, combined with the IRS requirements for the payroll credit. So I think we all kind of guessed that this kind of clarification would be coming based on what we already knew, um, but this makes it very clear. An employee can only take paid sick or expanded FMLA to care for their child for these reasons only when the employee needs to and actually is caring for his or her child, okay? And the Department of Labor says generally an employee doesn't need um, leave if there is another suitable individual that is available to provide the care the employee's child needs. So this gets into, <clears throat> excuse me, the employee's attestation saying, um, yes, right, so my child's uh, school or place of care has been closed for some time, um, and maybe I have been wor wor working remotely for some time prior to April 1st, but on April 1st, if I am saying I need leave for that reason, it makes sense for the employer to engage in some conversation 
about what what circumstances change, right? <coughs> because um, the employee, or excuse me, the child's school or place of care has been closed for some time. What has changed? And, and certainly, the circumstance could have changed. Um, you know, the the individual that was previously caring for the person in the home is no longer available. All those pieces. But again, um, the DOL is is making clear here that that's the expectation. And again, on the IRS side. Uh, the need for the employer to engage in some dialogue regarding substantiation for need for that leave to open the door for the payroll tax credits on the back end. So just highlighting that for you. Next slide, please. And covered reason number six um, that, to be very honest, was confusing to me in the very beginning. And unfortunately, um, our temporary rule has provided no additional information. So if we remember reason number six, um, substantially similar condition. Um, so paid sick leave applies if the employee is unable to work because the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar conditions specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with the Secretary of Treasury and Secretary of Labor. So all of this to say that uh, that sentence is still the only sentence that exists regarding this reason. Um, and so we will continue to keep an eye out for any um, additional guidance from the Department of Labor of what that might mean, because um, that'll be important for us to keep in mind, um, since it seems like we have these first five reasons down pretty well. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Um, the next piece, and again, we're just kind of talking high level here on things that were um, interesting to us in terms of something that was new or different or provided additional clarification. And so part of that is <clears throat> the amount of time that varied schedule employees are entitled to. So if we remember, we talked about um, paid sick leave, um, Folks who are in a full-time status receive up to 80 hours. Uh, folks who are in a part-time status receive uh, the amount of time that they typically work um, in, in a two-week period in very scheduled employees. The Department of Labor had kind of the six-month uh, take a look. And so they've provided some additional guidance on what that needs to look like. So they are now saying that we need to be using the daily average to compute this employee's two-week average. So I'm a varied schedule employee, and to determine how much paid time I get under emergency paid sick leave, I need to look at the amount of hours I typically work in a day and average that out across a two-week period, okay? So that's the clarification point here. The Department of Labor says an employer could also use twice the number of hours an employee is scheduled to work um, per work week and averaging that out over a six month period, which I think um, is what the initial kind of Q&A told us, but they provided this uh, additional daily average piece as a way to compute time for those folks as well. Next slide, please. Another important point, talking about expanded FMLA, um, it clear, the, the temporary rule rather is clarifying for us that the amount of unpaid time is two weeks. So if we remember, the original version talked about the first 10 days may consist of unpaid leave and thereafter the employee is eligible for uh, paid time at two thirds their regular rate, so on and so forth, up to a maximum of 12 weeks, right? So we remember that. However, um, the department recognized that there was some inconsistency between the provisions under expanded FMLA and the emergency paid sick leave piece under FFCRA. And so they decided to, um, to ensure some consistency. They made that um, time period consistent, but also for the reason, right, that we have an employee who can take um, those first, uh, that first period of time under expanded FMLA, that's a covered emergency paid sick leave reason too, right? So part of the reason here is to ensure consistency for the employee who is deciding to take that first portion of time paid under EPSLA so that they can go um, uh, more seamlessly into not having their pay, their two-thirds pay interrupted during the entire time that they are off 
um, for that school place of care closure reason, okay? So again, just a clarification that under expanded FMLA, that first piece of unpaid time lasts for two weeks rather than 10 days. Next slide, please. And the next couple slides, um, I, I will warn you, involve a little bit of math, <laughs> but let's try not to get um, too bogged down um, in, in some of the details here. Just wanting to make it clear, the Department of Labor has clarified what they mean by regular rate um, as it applies to employees taking pay um, under these provisions. So essentially, the department has said they believe the regular rate used for pay under FFCRA provisions should generally be representative of the employee's regular uh, rate from week to week. And it contemplates employees who have different regular rates from week to week and wanting to kind of give the benefit to the employee um, for those, those rate differences, right? So they've provided a um, process for you to follow. I think generally, um, most of your employees probably have the same regular rate from week to week, right? Um, maybe they're, they're on a, a generally regular schedule with a generally same base rate of pay. Um, you know, shift differentials and things like that may change based on, on those pieces, but generally this might be the same number. So this is generally talking about uh, the folks uh, where that those numbers are different and making sure the employee gets the benefit of those differences. So essentially the department is saying we should be averaging um, and it should be a weighted average for the, um, based on the hours worked each work week. So if we go to the next slide, we can kind of take this through um, a math example here. So as I just mentioned, in most situations, this calculation is gonna be relatively straightforward. An individual's weekly regular rate is going to be that employee's total compensation for the week divided by the employee's total hours for the week, okay? So if we look at the regular rate for a six month period prior to an individual's leave, we simply look at the total compensation for the six months uh, prior to them taking leave and look at the total divided by the total hours for those six months and that's how we arrive at this regular rate, okay? Next slide, please. The department provided this exact uh, math example in the commentary preceding the temporary rule, just so we can put some numbers to this so we can understand what they are saying by this weighted average. So if we have an employee whose regular rate in the first week is $10 an hour because their total comp was $400 and they worked 40 hours, so their regular rate is 10, and then they worked a second week and their total compensation was $200 and they worked 10 hours. So we know their regular rate in that second week was $20 an hour. Instead of simply averaging those, right, we are going to do a weighted average. The weighted average of the regular rate over the two week period is $12 an hour because we're taking the total comp, 400 plus 200, and dividing that by the total hours, 40 hours by 10 hours, so for a total of 50 hours. So that's just a math example to show you what, what the Department of Labor intends to mean when they're talking about a weighted average for the number of hours and making sure that is the hourly rate you are paying folks um, for, for emergency paid sick leave, or excuse me, basing, um, basing the amount that you pay for emergency paid sick leave um, or expanded FMLA, okay? Let's go ahead and take a break for another set of questions. I've seen a couple roll in there, Mike. What, is, what does it look like? Great, thanks, Cindy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll start with a question that uh, we just simply don't have the answer to quite yet. Uh, and it, it's a great question. It, and it is spouses who work for the same employers, are they limited to a total of 12 weeks of uh, expanded FMLA or 80 hours of uh, paid sick leave? And I can tell you, that the reason we get this question is of course, under the FMLA, um, spouses who work for the same employer are limited to a total of 12 weeks for the 
uh, for the birth of a child or the placement of a child for adoption or in foster care or uh, the care of, of a parent. Um, and so the question is, is there a similar limitation for uh, the, these new benefits for spouses who work for the same employer? And, and the fact is, we don't see that limitation listed anywhere in the act or anywhere in the regulations. And as a result, um, but, but, but we don't see it answered either. So a, as a result, uh, I would not advise you to take the position that married uh, employees are only entitled to a, a maximum of 12 weeks total, but rather everyone qualifies on their own individual basis. If there is new or different guidance on that issued, we will of course uh, provide it to you. Seems like the kind of question that the uh, Department of Labor should have answered, uh, but but did not. Okay, um, the next question is, if you have uh, workers on unemployment, do you have to pay them PTO as well? And that's similar to a couple of other questions that we have. The, the, the answer to that is no. You, you continue to pay your paid time off consistent with your policy and consistent with your uh, with your practice. And so the, if you would pay that otherwise, then, then you do. But if you don't uh, normally pay that when somebody is off, then, then you don't do that. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. Are employees eligible, the next one is, are employees eligible uh, for emergency paid sick leave if they are essential workers? And, and the answer to that is yes. So we spoke earlier about the exemption for healthcare workers and for small businesses, and there are other exemptions as well, but th someone's designation as an essential worker doesn't mean that they're not qualified for these, these benefits, right? The, the exemptions apply and um, we can analyze those and apply those as, as necessary, but uh, essential workers, there's no broad exemption for people listed as exemption, uh, as essential workers, sorry. The, the next question is this, uh, we hired a new employee who was unable to start due to COVID-19. Um, does that person have the ability to file for unemployment benefits? So in this scenario, it appears that the start date was delayed, not because of symptoms, but because of the effect on, on business and we're not prepared to onboard a new employee at this time, even though uh, we made an offer uh, at a time when we thought we were going to be able to. And the answer to that is yes, the, the, the person in that circumstance certainly should apply for unemployment unemployment benefits. Now, there may be some technical uh, analysis on which employer gets charged for those unemployment benefits, whether it's uh, the current employer or, or a former employer, but frankly, that's, that's an analysis that is uh, not critically important at this point in the process. Uh, rather, that, that person is almost certainly going to be eligible and, uh, and should definitely apply. Okay. Um, here's a here's a very interesting one. What if an what if the employer sends an employee home for symptoms of illness, which may not be COVID nineteen symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath, but symptoms like sore throat, headache, etc. Would they be eligible for uh, FFCRA benefits? It's a great question, and you know, in this situation, like in all of our other FMLA, ADA uh, situations, we never want to play healthcare provider. Of course, you want to be cautious. Uh, and if someone is having symptoms of being ill, you can certainly send them home. But I think in that situation, you don't make the determination of whether or not the symptoms qualify or don't. We're going to rely on that individual's healthcare provider to provide us the documentation to support that that person had symptoms or otherwise um, uh, possibly had COVID-19, and that was the reason why they were unable to come to work. So in that case, uh, 
um, we would recommend it that you get confirmation from the healthcare uh, provider and use that documentation to determine whether or not uh, FFCRA benefits are, are available. Um, let's see, we've, the questions are rolling in, so I want to um, get to them. Uh, here's one, part-time employees work in the schools and so programs aren't running. Are these employees eligible for paid sick leave or expanded FMLA? And the answer is, is no, right? It, there is no business to be done. And as a result, uh, these folks aren't working and that is not one of the, the qualifying reasons. Um, here's a question asking for clarification on uh, the last round of questions, which was, um, we had somebody off due to one of the six listed reasons prior to April 1st, they're still off now. Um, the rule says it's not retroactive, so can you please clarify? So yes, so if, somebody needs to be off starting on and after April 1st due to one of the listed reasons, then they are eligible for benefits, even if that leave started before April 1st. Okay. All right. Um, how do you determine uh, if an individual actually has symptoms? We advise someone to have a test and they were told they did not meet the criteria. So is this an, this an honor system? And I think that's similar to, to the previous question. Of course, we're, we're going to deal with uh, the employee individually and see what he or she has to say about how they're feeling. Um, and then we're going to rely on healthcare providers to provide the, the information. Uh, my guess is this question is sort of uh, driving at, there's a lot of room here for employees to tell you things that may or may not actually be true. and of course, that's that's the case. There's a lot of room here to uh, for people to work this system, but I'd encourage you to take each case on its face, uh, deal with them uh, in good faith, and work with them to see what those symptoms are. Again, always being able to rely on what the healthcare provider says. So, all right, let's see. Um, What kind of documentation can you require someone to have? So, uh, so many people have not been able to see their doctor or get tested but are sick. So the Department of Labor and the IRS are going to tell you that we need written documentation uh, to confirm the need for the, the leave in order to qualify for the, the tax credits. And certainly getting some documentation from the uh, from the healthcare provider is going to be uh, extremely helpful. But in, in a situation where that's not uh, possible, what I'd recommend is that you get as much affirmation from the employee as you possibly can, the, the dates, the times, the, the details of the symptoms, and document all of that. Frank Rapp, I guess that advice is do the very best that you can. Uh, to get the documentation and then determine if you have enough to make a claim for the, uh, have enough to qualify for the leave. And then of course, to make the claim for, for the, the tax credits. I think I would urge people to try and get some documentation from the healthcare provider, even if that's just a letter of some kind. Um, and, and maybe there'll be some delay in between the, uh, the date that the leave is requested and the time that that documentation comes through. But I, I continue to uh, to urge employees to provide that information if it is at all available, because at some point this is all going to slow down. Hopefully this is all going to slow down. And then um, we're going to be at the point removed from this where we're applying for these tax credits and uh, we're going to need as much documentation on this as the IRS requires. So, Sandy, why don't there are a number of questions in here regarding the Executive Order 36 and its relation to the state quarantine order 
and people are uh, continuing to struggle with this, which we totally understand um, because it is a hard piece to wrap your head around. And so, Sandy, if you wouldn't mind, would you go over that piece uh, quickly one more time? Because I think that'll help answer about six or seven of the questions that we have remaining here. Of course, you bet. So let's start first with our framework, okay? So the first question we should always be asking ourselves is why is this employee requesting leave or why is the employee requesting to not work? And if the employee is requesting, um, or excuse me, if, if your business is closed or limited because of EO 21, right, the general stay at home order, and you do not have work available, the door for reason number one under FFCRA does not open for that employee. The, the, the crux of that evaluation is do you have work available? And if there's no work available for that employee, there's no reason for them to be taking leave because you don't have uh, work, work for them to take leave from. The difference with 2020-36, the new order is specific to an employee, okay? So if there is a government order or a isolation quarantine order that prevents the employee from working or teleworking, that could be a reason covered under FFCRA. So for example, under 2020-21, the general stay at home order, your organization is operating, you've got critical infrastructure, <clears throat> your critical infrastructure or your supporting or service provider of critical infrastructure. So you still have folks on site or you still have folks who are teleworking. And now your employee starts to experience symptoms as outlined in executive order 36. They start to experience symptoms related to 36 that prevent them from coming to work or teleworking that employee, um, presuming that they follow all the pieces in that executive order, that employee now is, um, sub they are subject to a isolation or quarantine order that is preventing him or her from working or teleworking, okay? And so then they may have an entry point under reason number one. So that's the distinction. Reason number one, all of the reasons always are predicated on you as the employer having work available. And if you have no work available, regardless of what um, orders um, are, are currently on the table, right? Uh, 2021, um, as an example, the general stay at home order, if, if you don't have work available for an employee to perform, that employee doesn't need leave from work. Okay, because there's no work for that person. However, under EO 36, if an employee starts to experience symptoms and they are now um, unable to work or telework, they likely have an entry point under reason number one. Okay, so that's an important distinction. Okay, let's quickly, um, I see that it is nine o'clock, so I understand there may be folks who are hopping off. Just as a reminder, the webinar and presentation will be posted on our website, but we have just a few quick points to finish up, um, and then we will send everybody on their way. So um, the next piece, um, if we remember, uh, the definition of healthcare provider. So the, in the temporary rule, the Department of Labor has clarified this is not a new definition, um, but remember there are two definitions. The group that can um, provide the substantiation for a need for an employee to be off of leave, right? So a healthcare provider who can say, yep, this person needs to be subject to uh, self-quarantine at my direction. That's one type of healthcare provider. But there's another type of healthcare provider that an employer can exclude from pro, um, providing paid uh, benefits under FFCRA folks who fall into this healthcare provider category. And so if we remember from before, from our previous webinars, this list is very expansive. Anyone employed by any doctor's office, hospital, healthcare center, clinic, uh, medical school, local health department, nursing facility, so on and so forth. I won't repeat all of those. 
But essentially what the, what the department has done here is provided us an explanation for that broad type of definition. And essentially they're saying they are including um, anyone whose services are necessary to com uh, combat the COVID-19 public health emergency. And that includes um, not only medical professionals, but those other workers who are needed to keep hospitals and similar healthcare facilities well supplied and operational. So that's their explanation for why they define that term so broadly. So we wanted to provide that to you. Next slide, please. Similar, um, similar thought regarding their definition for emergency responder. They did not change the definition. Um, from the, the Q&As compared to the, the temporary rule, but again, just further provided an explanation. So here they talk about um, the balance, right, between F FCRA, right, we want to be able to provide these benefits um, so employees aren't forced to choose between their paycheck um, and um, or taking um, unpaid leave, but also we understand that there are certainly public health measures that are necessary to combat this pandemic. Um, and so talking about um, the need for providing paid leave cannot come at the expense of fully staffing these necessary functions so that we can all get on the other side. So again, no new definition for how they have um, defined emergency responder, which again is very, very broad. Um, but just an explanation for why they've taken such a broad um, look at that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so by now we remember um, that you need to be um, under 500 employees for these FFCRA provisions to apply to you. So that has not changed. What is not new, right, is who we should be counting. So we need to count our full-time, part-time employees on leave, temp employees who are jointly employed, um, and not count independent contractors. So that is not new. That existed in the Q&As. Um, but what is new is some clarification and guidance on how we should be thinking about folks who we have on layoff or furlough. So generally, the department is saying employees who are in either of those statuses and do not that who do not um, subsequently become reemployed do not count towards that threshold. So if prior to April 1 or even after April 1 you've engaged in some layoff and furloughs, um, those employees should not be counted to determine where you are in terms of the 500 employee threshold. And if you remember from previous webinars, um, we, we look at that count at the time an employee requests leave. It's kind of a snapshot, um, which is more work certainly on you as the employer, um, because in these times, certainly that, that number can be jumping up and down um, as the days go by. Um, but just some additional guidance there related to laid off or furloughed employees. Next slide, please. The next piece deals with intermittent leave. So what is not new is that intermittent leave is always predicated on agreement by the employer. So you as the employer can always say no, right? All of these reasons for leave need to be continuous. We don't have the ability to uh, grant intermittent leave uh, because of our operations, whatever those reasons would be, right? So you always retain, retain that piece. But what the temporary rule did clarify, actually, is that intermittent leave can be taken for any of the covered reasons if the employee agrees and the employee is working remotely. But intermittent leave can only be used for uh, school or uh, place of care closure if the employee is still working on site, okay? So you, you need to evaluate that a little bit differently. If you already have somebody who's working remotely or have someone who has the ability to work remotely, you as the employer have a bit more flexibility to decide if a requested leave that that employee has taken will be granted on an intermittent basis. However, if you are a critical infrastructure employer or um, a supplier or a service provider to critical infrastructure and you still have folks working on site and one of those folks working on site requests leave on an intermittent basis, 
you are only to say yes or even consider saying yes, I should say, if the request for leave is related to school or place of care closure. And again, the reason there, right, is to make sure that um, the exposure to the work site is limited. And if somebody's already working remotely, um, even if they are experiencing symptoms or subject to self-quarantine, um, they have very little ability to expose the rest of the employment base um, to those symptoms, and so that's that's where the differentiation and the reason for uh, flexibility comes in. So just a clarification point there. Next slide, please. So um, again, just a little bit of clarification on the notice requirements. So what is not new is the model notice. The Department of Labor, Labor issued a model notice, and they have that up on their website, and that is an employer is free to use that. But what was clarified here, and again, is an employer friendly um, interpretation here, which is nice for employers who are now covered by expanded FMLA, but were not covered by any of the other provisions of the FMLA, right? So we've got different um, uh, covered employer requirements for those. The department has said that posting the FFR, FFCRA notice satisfies their FMLA general notice obligation. So for you employers who were not subject to FMLA, but you are now subject to expanded FMLA, that model notice gets you where you need to be on the notice side. You do not need to print out um, the Department of Labor's what I'll call regular um, FMLA notice uh, requirements and post those or educate your employees on those. So that is nice. Next slide, please. And in a similar vein, another employer uh, friendly decision here regarding designation notices. So for um, the employers out there who are listening, who have who are subject to regular FMLA, you know that you have requirements related to uh, notifying your employees of eligibility, rights and responsibilities, written designations when employers request or employees request leave and so on. So what the department has said here is the FFCRA regulations do not require you to respond to your employees who request to use expanded FMLA with those types of notifications. Whether you are, um, whether you are an employer who is subject to FMLA or is an employer who is now subject to expanded FMLA, neither of you are required to issue those types of designation notices to your employees for the expanded FMLA reasons. Certainly, if you have a, if you're a employer who is covered by FMLA and you have those processes in place and you want to fold in those types of notifications to your employees um, for reason for requesting leave related to expanded FMLA, you certainly can, but employers are not at all required to do that. Okay. Next slide, please. And just because um, these are such serious times and we have to find a little bit of humor. I think the Department of Labor is trying to keep all of us on our toes here um, by talking about um, the uh, paid sick leave 80 hour limit. So the Department of Labor is saying to us that once an employee takes 80 hours of paid sick leave, they are not entitled to any paid sick leave from a subsequent employer. So if an employee is changing positions before they take 80 hours of paid sick, the new employer, if they're covered by FFCRA, needs only to provide the balance to the total of 80 hours um, to that's all that employee would be eligible for. So to me, um, I guess this is an employer friendly rule. Um, however, I'm not sure um, in the state of, of where we all are as human resources professionals and employers, um, how we would fold in communication to subsequent and former uh, employers to, to deal with these limits. Um, but I suppose um, this is an employer friendly type of rule. And so we probably should recognize the Department of Labor um, for, for folding this in there. Um, um, but at this point, you know, I don't have any recommendations on how to make that seamless for you other than keeping it in the back of your mind as something that you uh, potentially could uh, fold into your processes as we get down the road. 
And that is uh, the end of the prepared slides. I'm not sure if there are a few additional theme questions you see there, Mike. <clears throat> there are uh, some additional questions, but I'm answering those directly. And so I think given the time, we should wrap it up now. I'm gonna to continue to try and work through some of the questions that were submitted. Um, but if you need anything else, obviously you can contact Sandy or, or myself or anyone else at, at Miller Johnson. We'd be happy to answer any of these questions. Uh, I, I know a number of people asked about form policies and we have been working on those things. So feel free to contact any, any of us and we can get um, policies and uh, forms in your hands that you can use when people request leave. So we've gone long over our allotted time, so we'll stop there. Thank you so much for joining us. We will, uh, of course, let you know when we uh, schedule new webinars. And if you have any thoughts or suggestions for us, please uh, let us know. We'd be happy to get you all the information that you need to work your way through these, these very trying times. Thanks so much.